Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 25th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, new Senate President Macheki outlines the right objectives, but achieving them will take a lot of work and the legislature is very slow getting out of the gate. Second, the language of the governor's proposed constitutional amendments don't line up with the stated objectives. We outline why. And third, forget Anwar. Here's the real potential impact on Alaska of President Biden's pause on federal lands. And now, let's join Michael. Well, let's dive into the top three. The first and foremost one is uh, talking about this article that uh, was in the Juno Empire, and it was quoting Peter Machicki uh, as saying, it must be done this year, that this is it, where backs are into the corner. Uh, of course, the money quote in that whole article was the comment that uh, that you pulled out, which basically said, look, now's the time we've got to start paying for our services, and uh, you know we've got to recognize that this is what we're going to do, that we're going to have a smaller dividend, that we're going to have uh, – uh, you know, we have to start paying for our own services and all this kind of stuff. And, and you know, I understand. Uh, I understand that, that, uh, that, that this is the uh, kind of the attitude that for somehow we haven't been paying for our services up until po- this point. But uh, let's, let's take a crack at it from your point of view. What, what do you say about this? Well, the quote, uh, the quote is lower uh, – uh, uh, Michiki's talking about uh, what the solution should be. Lower dividends, reduction in cost of government, additional industry participation, and considering how Alaskans are going to participate in paying for those services. Uh, with, with one exception, that's actually, that actually picks up on all the themes that the governor's been talking about. Lower dividends, the governor's budget proposes to go to – uh, to restructure the, the, the PFD to go to POMV uh, 5050, which is a different basis from, uh, uh, from the statutory uh, uh, provision that we currently have uh, that will result in, uh, in lower dividends. Uh, reduction in the cost of government. The governor has proposed significant reductions uh, in, in the cost of where government uh, where, where the cost of government would be if we continue business as usual. He's proposed significant reductions, even in the cost of government. If you just take the the last uh, cost of government and and increase it by inflation, uh, the governor's proposed significant reductions. So that so that point of Senator Macheki picks up on the governor. Uh, the final one was considering how Alaskans are going to participate in paying for services. We've talked on the program before uh, that the governor's budget. Uh, has about a billion dollars in other revenues uh, that that have to come from some place, and the governor's talked about uh, it coming from uh, from taxes, uh, beginning in FY23 and continuing through the remainder of the decade. Um, and so that sort of picks up on a theme that the governor governor has had. The the one point that Senator Machiki layered on, which I found interesting, that the governor hasn't talked about yet, is quote additional industry participation. And I've right. taken that, and others have taken that to mean oil taxes, uh, right. readdressing uh, oil taxes. So um, he, the, sen- the, the senator has really outlined the same same themes, the same issues um, uh, with the with the addition of industry quote industry participation, same themes that that the governor has. 
Um, and I and I think that's good. The senator also talked about increased transparency and increased communication uh, with Alaskans about these issues, and that would be good too. Uh, I know that that's been something that uh, Alexi Painter, the new director of uh, legislative finance, has focused on as well. Uh, in in the past, he has said that uh, perhaps uh, Juno's become too isolated, uh, insulated, that they you know talk their own language, and it's really not. They're really explaining things to Alaskans well. And one of the one of the things that he intends to focus on, he said, uh, uh, is to make uh, is to make the budget and the budget process more transparent. I think he's doing a good thing, good things in that regard by focusing on uh, the current law budget and, and current policy budget and making it transparent how uh, how the legislature in the past and potentially in the future uh, continues to ignore uh, current law and adopts policies that are inconsistent with current law. And I think that help that's helpful in, in explaining the transparency. So all of these all of these are are. Good things, and I think Senator Manchicki has outlined a, 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 a good uh, standard, a good uh, goal uh, of, of pursuing those four things. But but here's where the rubber meets the road. I don't know how the heck they get that done uh, in this legislature. Um, I, I know he says that it needs to be done this year. Other Senate presidents have said that it need, has needed to be done in the past. Have said that it needs to be done in their in in their years. Uh, the legislature is off to a very slow start, not only because of um, because of the House's inability yet to organize, and so you re- you, we've re- really only got one body functioning, uh, but also there really aren't any bills yet before the legislature. And we're talking about a legislature that, that still is dealing with COVID. Uh, many say want to get out of there as fast as they can. Uh, there aren't any bills yet that really uh, address uh, uh, some of these things. I mean, the governor's got a budget in that does reduce the cost of government uh, in the near term, but it sort of does it by blunt force. Uh, it doesn't revise any of the formulas uh, that uh, that drive uh, the cost of, uh, of significant costs of government. Um, uh, Senator Machicki talks about additional in- industry participation. There's no bills, to my knowledge, that have been filed yet. Uh, that uh, at least by the majority that, that talk about uh, increased industry participation uh, modifications to oil taxes. Uh, considering how Alaskans are going to participate in paying for their services, uh, you have you have a couple of bills that uh, that talk about uh, uh, taxes, new revenues. Uh, uh, Adam Wool's uh, uh, flat uh, modified flat tax. Um, uh, another uh, that has a progressive income tax, uh, but there's really no been no bills filed that uh, that, that try to bring that uh, all together. Certainly on the Senate side, uh, lower dividends. Uh, there is there are constitutional amendments that have been put in to go to POMV 5050, um, uh, but uh, uh, the governor's constitutional amendment doesn't do that. Uh, Willikowski's, I think, is the is the only one. Uh, that does so. I I appreciate Senator Machicki's goals. I I think he's hitting on the right themes, uh, but but the legislature is off to a very slow start. If this is going to be the year we're going to move it, uh, the legislature is really off to a very slow start in trying to accomplish that. And so I suppose it, it remains to be seen uh, how uh, how the legislature is going to to handle uh, these. Uh, these goals right. and and how it's going to implement these goals. Right. I do I I, I do uh, like the the focus on transparency and the focus on uh, you know increasing the under, understanding of Alaskans on the issues. But but once again, we're going to see how uh, we're going to have to see that how he follows through on that, how the Senate follows through on that uh, in delivering that sort of increased understanding uh, to Alaskans. Uh, I do like the, you know, I do like the fact that he takes the bull by the horns to basically says, look, you know, our backs are against the wall and we've got to do it. We can't keep putting it off. I mean, I admire that and I appreciate that Um, for those out there that continue to say, well, we should, you know, focus on the cuts only approach. I think you could see this already. I mean, there are already cuts are in there. Sure. Reductions in the cost of government. But that's all, again, bookended by lower dividends and Alaskans participating and paying for their services. So, I mean, I think that 
there's just, again, not the political will that you and I have talked about in the past to get this done. I would like to see that be first and foremost, reducing the cost of government, They're not talking about lowering dividends. Uh, but it's there already. And and I guess I, I do want to come back and I don't I don't mean to be, you know, keep harping on this. But this idea that somehow Alaskans are going to participate in paying for their services seems to complete be completely oblivious to the fact that we have been, although we don't see the money directly. But all that collectively owned resource, all those monies from those resources go straight to the government. We've been paying for those things for years. And it's that they have outstripped the supply of what we're what we're giving them at this point. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Michael. I mean, in the in the past five years, we've seen it in the form of reduced PFDs, uh, in the form of essentially PFD taxes, uh, the diversion of statutory income uh, due Alaskans over to uh, government, which is the classic definition of a tax. So, um, yeah, yeah, you, I'm, you're right. Alaskans have been paying for government. Uh, the question is whether they pay more. The the the, the the spending cuts um, is is interesting. The governor's budget uh, does do that. I did a chart a while back, and I'll and I'll stick it up again sometime this week. Uh, that tra- that looks at what uh, 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 if we continue business as usual, what spending would be, and also if we just increase current spending levels by inflation, what that would be. Uh, and the governor's budget essentially cuts a billion dollars uh, from. From you know business from the business as usual case a billion dollars a year over the course of uh, over the course of the next decade. The challenge with that is even after you cut that billion dollars, it's more than a billion dollars, a billion three hundred million dollars. The challenge is even after you cut that that billion dollars, you still have an additional billion dollars in uh, in deficits, uh, and that's after that's after restructuring the PFD to POMB fifty fifty. So. You know, we're talking about we, we, we we're talking about deficits um, uh, from business as usual of roughly forty percent of the budget, uh, and the governor cuts roughly twenty percent of that. Um, there's another twenty percent still sitting still sitting as deficits, uh, and there's really there's no plan. Uh, there is no plan to the governor doesn't have a plan. No one has introduced a plan. To, to try to wipe out that additional 20%, that additional billion dollars uh, by spending cuts. Uh, there's no legislation to do that. There's no restructuring of the formulas. There's no uh, additional cuts, deep cuts that would have to take place to K-12. through 12. None of that uh, is on the table. So it essentially leaves a billion dollars of, of additional deficits that have to be met through, uh, through additional revenues. Larry says the House is acting like last year, meaning I guess it's taking its sweet time trying to organize, really can't get anything done. Larry says, but how is the Senate dragging their feet? Um, I think it's because there's really just no bills in there to deal with it. Brad, am I wrong on that? Or how is no, the Senate dragging your feet? No, you're exactly right, Michael. The Senate, the, the, the Senate, the Senate's gotten itself organized. It took it a while to get organized, and and that explains likely explains some of it. But there's really there's no bills out there. We're talking about if they're talking about a 120 day session, you know, some of them still are talking about a 90 day session. But even if you're talking about a 120 day session, you need bills because you need you need the process to start. You need the analysis to start. You need people to be digging into the language as we're going to be talking about constitutional amendments in, the, in a moment. You need people to, you know, starting to parse through and, and, and find and find holes and, you know, start having language to, to, to agree around. Uh, and, and as I was, as I said, uh, during the, during the uh, segment, uh, we really don't have any language. We really don't have any bills yet, uh, out of the Senate. Now they may come quickly. Uh, and, and we may, we may get off to a, a, a sort of a delayed, but a, but a but a strong start when those bills come out, but until we until we have those bills, uh, uh, it's really you're you're really not starting the process, and 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 in particular things like I mean if we're really going to cut spending, even the governor's spending cuts, uh, uh, you know some people say it doesn't go deep enough, but even even the amount that the governor's cut, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to change formulas, you're going to have to change the K through 12 formula, you're going to have to change the Medicaid formula. Uh, you're going to have to change exactly what you're doing with the university. Those are the big three, um, and you're going to have to you're going to have to focus in on changing those formulas. And if and and to change the formulas, you need statutes. To have statutes, you need you need bills. And and so it's really 
so far we've we've talked the right principles. I mean, that's my point about Machuki's piece. He's talked the right principles, but 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 the 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 step, the important step of getting bills out there and getting the analysis started and getting ledge finance to do the to do the numbers um, and 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 you know getting legal to work on the on the on the changes that need to be made to the bills. That process hasn't started at all, as Lisa, right. at least as far as I can tell. Well, and I think you, you make the valid point. I mean, Donna Ardwin's in the chat room. She says the governor's budget doesn't cut a billion dollars out. And as you say, it also doesn't go any de- it doesn't give us any specifics. I mean, that's the problem. We've talked on this program ad nauseum with you and others and I mean Harold and everybody else in there. I mean, the big ones, you know, health and social services, cutting out the optional Medicaid, you know, breaking into the funding formulas for the uh, for the base student allocation, separating out instructional and support, uh, you know, costs, uh, consolidating, uh, consolidating school districts down, uh, you know, saving on health care, consolidating the university. I mean, these are huge things. If we don't get those things in hand, then the monster is just going to continue to grow and keep eating at the budget regardless of how much money we pour into it. Yeah, exactly right. And, yeah, and you, you know, you've got people like Senator Roger Holland is, is, is the chair of Senate Education. If we're going to make serious, if we're going to make serious progress in getting the cost of K through 12 down, which which you know to, to cut a billion dollars out, you got to do. Uh, if we're going to make serious changes in K through 12, you got to be you got to be going. You got to be you got to be getting at that. And um, and you know Roger Holland's great, uh, ran a great race, but he's a uh, he's a he's a he's a he's a rookie down there, and he is he's not an education specialist. I don't think even he would claim to be an education specialist. Um, and yet he's in charge. He's going to be in charge of dealing. Uh, with that segment, and we got bills out there for for him to be dealing with. So it's, it's Machiki's saying the right things, and and given the fact it took the Senate until the first day of the session to get organized, you understand why they're running a little bit. Be- they're running behind, but they are running behind. And and to implement uh, to achieve these these objectives that he's laid out, to achieve the objectives that the governor's laid out, you need the bills. You need to be you need to be working on this stuff. Uh, you need to have details to be working on, and we're and we're just not there. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, going back into the uh, chat room here, Mia uh, Maya says, "Cut and restructure." It's literally such a simple concept. The answer is not more bills and laws that are already dated positions of budgets. Uh, anyone who has paid their own bills know that a budget requires constant revision and attention. It's so frustrating. Uh, Willie says, audit Native Health Services, you'll find enough corruption in billing and spending to pay a full PFD. I mean, we've talked about that's part of the whole HSS, Medicaid, Medicare, not only eliminate the optional services, but there's been anecdotal discussion of, you know, Medicaid fraud that's gone on for years that some say is is rampant, uh, but nobody really wants to touch it. So, but I mean, eventually somebody's going to have to start calling these things out. Yeah, exactly, Michael, and and that takes that takes detail, that takes work, that takes bills. Twenty um, seconds. I mean, we've we've got K, we've got a K through twelve statute. To cut K through twelve, you've got to you've got to change that statute, or else yeah. every year it just keeps going. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. Moving on to number two, we're going to get the quick tease here before we go to break. Uh, Brad, the governor put out an opinion piece back in December talking about a path forward for Alaskans, and part of that highlighted the need for constitutional amendments, and the verbiage of those have now come out. Uh, you want to give us a little bit of a sneak peek here on number two before we jump to the break? Yep. Last Friday, the governor filed uh, the the language, uh, filed bills that would be the, the language of the constitutional amendments. Uh, the three constitutional amendments are to uh, constitutionalize the PFD, to create a spending cap, and uh, have uh, uh, require any taxes to go to uh, go to the um, uh, to the to the public for vote. Uh, the language uh, isn't isn't what you would think in some cases uh, about uh, about those three issues. The language is important. Uh, I know it's going to be worked on during the legislature, but this is the starting point that the governor's thrown out there, and uh, and I want to walk through a little bit of the language to sort of show. 
uh, the the gap between sort of the objective and 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 the language that uh, that the governor's put forward so far. The reality. I mean, this is what he says wants to happen, but this is what the language actually says, and what does it actually mean for us, and and how does it have to be changed to actually hit what the uh, what they're saying that they want to accomplish? Am I reading that right? Yep. Exactly. Okay. All right. We're diving into number two, which is the constitutional amendments that have now been proposed by the Dunleavy administration. The governor put forward a plan back in December on how he wanted a path forward, so to speak, uh, on what he wanted. And now that the uh, the roadmap is there, does it actually take us where we want to go? Brad Keithley, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's important for for people who are interested in this to, to go read the 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 specific constitutional provisions that the governor proposed uh, last Friday to achieve the, the three objectives. And again, the three objectives are uh, to, to impose a spending cap, constitutionalize the PFD, and, and, uh, and, and require a voter approval of, uh, of any taxes. Um, and, and, and sort of walk through this for themselves. But I did it uh, over the weekend. I looked at the constitutional amendments, and, and, I, and I think there's a gap between the objectives that some think the governor's laid out, at least, uh, and the language. For example, on the spending cap, the, the key language is this. Appropriations from the Treasury, and this is from SJR 5, which is the governor's proposed constitutional amendment to implement the spending cap. Appropriations from the Treasury made for a fiscal year shall not exceed the average of the appropriations made in the previous three fiscal years by more than the cumulative percent change derived from indices as, as prescribed by law in population or inflation, whichever is greater over the previous three calendar years. So basically the proposal is to take the, the spending, the appropriations made the previous three years, average that out, adjust that by inflation or population growth, whichever is, whichever is uh, uh, higher, uh, over over uh, for the for the for the current year, and then adjust spending levels by that. Well, when you do that, we still have deficits. Um, I mean, that's what the governor's that's what the governor's uh, proposed budget is basically doing. It's basically uh, proposing an implementation of this constitutional provision, and with the constitutional provision, we're still we're still running deficits of about a billion dollars a year that the governor proposes to close through, quote, uh, other revenues. So if some people, if, if people are thinking that this spending cap is going to bring spending down to traditional revenues, uh, and, by, and by this constitutional provision, we're going to close those, de those deficits and get rid of the need for other revenues, that's not what this constitutional amendment uh, is proposing to do. It's essentially a spending-based uh, cap that builds off prior spending levels. So if you've been overspending relative to revenues, as we have been for a long time, overspending for uh, for for against revenues uh, uh, in the past, it locks that in, takes the average of the last three, locks that in, escalates it by either population or inflation, whichever is greater, uh, and and sets the new gap, sets the new gap, sets the new cap. The problem we've had with the old spending cap, that we have a spending cap in the Constitution, the problem with it was it was spending-based and spending started at a base level based upon then spending and escalated it uh, by, by inflation going out, and it just outstripped that cap, outstripped revenues. It's become so high, it's, it's irrelevant. This is setting up the same, the same situation. It's a spending-based cap uh, that continues to grow by inflation or population, it's based upon past spending levels, so if you've been overspending, it locks that in. I really don't think that constitutional amendment is achieving what people, the, the language is achieving what, uh, what people think uh, it's going to do. The, the same thing is, is true with the amendment to constitu constitutionalize the permanent fund. Uh, this, is what, this is the operative language, and this is SJR 6, uh, the governor's proposed constitutional amendment for permanent fund. Each fiscal year, the legislature may appropriate from the permanent fund to the general fund an amount as provided by law setting forth the percentage of the, a of the average fiscal year and market value of the permanent fund for the first five of the preceding six years, including the fiscal year just ended. And then the next provision is each fiscal year, a portion of the amount appropriated under B 
of this section shall be allocated for dividend payments to residents of the state as provided by law. A law that changes the amount allocated for dividend payments must be approved by voters. Well, so both of those, both of those provisions, both the one that's setting the amount the legislature may appropriate from the permanent fund and the amount that goes to dividends is, 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 is governed by a provision that says as provided by law. The law currently on the amount to be taken from the permanent fund is 5%. But, the, but the, there's nothing in the, in the constitutional provision that prevents the legislature from changing that to 10% or 15% or 20% uh, if, uh, if, they, if they choose to do so. It doesn't require a vote of the people to do that. It leaves that choice in the hands of the, in the, hands of the legislature. The same thing with respect to the, the amount of the dividend. It, it, it does say... That the, that the starting point for the amount of the dividend is 50%, because that's the current statute, is 50% of the amount of the, uh, uh, of the, of the, of the amount to, uh, taken by the legislature out of the, out of the permanent fund. But it doesn't, it doesn't lock that in at 50%. It says, as provided by law, uh, and the law may be changed. Indeed, the, the law could be changed from 50%. The law could be changed by the legislature before uh, the adoption of the constitutional amendment, and it could lock it, and, and then the constitutional amendment would 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 set it at 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 a different percentage. If the legislature chose 20 percent, for example, the uh, the that that would be what would be locked in uh, by the by the constitutional amendment for a period of time until changed as provided by law. So there's a lot of open-endedness uh, in this constitutional amendment. It doesn't say the permanent fund should, the permanent fund dividend shall always be 50 percent. Right, and it doesn't say that the draw from the permanent fund shall always be five percent of the value, or six percent, or somewhere between four and six percent. It leaves both of them very open-ended. Uh, and again, I don't think the, the language is sort of is is achieving what uh, what uh, what uh, the the uh, what some think the legislature is 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 is, is or what some think the governor's objectives are, or what some run read into the governor's language. The third one is uh, SJR seven, and that is the the, pro, the, the restrictions on uh, changing taxes um, uh, in uh, uh, without without vote of the people. And it says, and the language says, notwithstanding section eighteen of Article two, a law enacted under sections fourteen and seventeen of Article two that establishes a state tax shall not take effect unless it is approved by the voters of the state in the first statewide election held more than 180, 120 days. So it, it, does, it does say a state tax shall not take effect until it is approved by the voters of the state, but there's no definition of tax. And in Colorado, which has a tax cap, one of the things, <coughs> excuse me, one of the things that they've done down there is, is, to, is to start using the word fees instead of taxes. And so it, 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 I mean, their position is it's not a, it's not a tax if it's a fee. Um, and so there's, there's, there's wiggle room, <coughs> excuse me, there's wiggle room also in, uh, in, in this provision. This is, as I said, this is SJR seven, uh, the governor's SJR seven. Um, and, and, and it really doesn't, but because there's no definition of tax, because it doesn't add, uh, language that says or things similar to tax or things like that because it focuses entirely word on the word tax. Uh, you've got some you've got some substantial wiggle room that I think future future legislatures could uh, could use. So going back to you know my first point, the language is important. Bills are important. That's what that's what implements the goals that that people are talking about. That's why you need to be able to look. At, that's why you need to have bills to be able to look at the language to see if it actually is achieving. Uh, what they what they're telling you it achieves. In the case of these three amendments, uh, once you sort of parse through the language, I'm not sure they're achieving what uh, what at least my understanding is of, right. of, of how many people read uh, the governor's objectives. Well, uh, give me I got about two minutes here. Can you give me the changes that you would make to make sure that they do hit the governor's objectives? Some of the broad stroke changes that should be made before we run out of time here. Oh well, on the on the uh, uh, the the spending cap, I would make it a revenue-based cap. I would match uh, spending to revenues, and I would describe the revenues it's supposed to match to so it doesn't 
uh, it doesn't uh, become irrelevant as the current constitution provision was, uh, as the current constitution provision is. Uh, on the on the on the on the dividend, I would specify a percentage, fifty uh, percent of of the draw, and I would limit the legislature's ability to to change the draw from uh, uh, from five percent. Maybe put in a range, but in in any event, limit the legislature's ability to do that. Uh, and on the spending cap, or on the uh, uh, on the on the no taxes without going to a vote of the people, I would uh, I would definitely have a definition of tax, uh, and and I would I would work to limit the ability to do as be, has been done in Colorado and other places the ability to end run it uh, by coming up with other words to talk about. Uh, revenue enhancement measures <laughs> fees and stuff right i mean that's what it all comes down to it's not a tax it's a fee well wait do i pay it just like that yeah it's a tax so i'm serious so brad i mean i think we need a lengthy i think we need a lengthy breakdown with bullet points as to what needs to be changed because i think i think people are like okay good we've got our amendments here and they just again the no analysis i mean you and i have talked about this whole thing for example with the, with the spending cap uh, I mean, you want to talk about just starting off all wrong. I mean, a house uh, with a foundation built on sand is sure to crumble. And any kind of spending cap that's based on, you know, that's not based on a average of revenues or historical revenues or whatever is, I mean, to me, is doomed to fail. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, we've seen it, Michael. We've, that's that's the provision we've got in the Constitution right now, a spending-based cap that, 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 that just, uh, you know, escalates by inflation and, and just sort of spirals spirals way the heck away from uh, whatever revenues we have. And when you look forward, our revenues aren't going up. Our revenues certainly aren't going up by inflation. Uh, 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 oil prices are, are not climbing by inflation. Uh, the, the revenues we're coming out of the permanent fund may or may not climb by inflation, but there's no, there's no guarantee that revenues are going to keep up with inflation going forward. So if you set the spending cap at, 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 at spending plus inflation, it just builds on itself. It becomes it it, it 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 has a potential, just like the current spending cap does, quickly to become irrelevant. So right. I, I I I will comment on these. I will make these points uh, in posts uh, as we as we go through the process. But but people need to understand. I think the, the, my point is people need to understand that the language is not matching the objectives that many people uh, many people have sort of in their mind created for what uh, what the governor's constitutional amendments are supposed to do. Uh, all right, let's quickly dive into number three here. We've got about four minutes here, which, of course, is Biden's crack at uh, closing down uh, the leases on Anwar. Now he's talking about all, you know removing all oil and oil lease or gas leases and now coal leases as well. He's putting a moratorium. This is not just about shutting down Anwar. This is about a bigger picture. It is about a much bigger picture, but let's focus on the – Let's focus on what the impact is on Alaska. <laughs> Excuse me. As, as we've talked about before, Anwar, in, in the current oil environment and, and in the environment that, that most are now projecting, Anwar was, is never going to happen. I mean, there's just not enough industry appetite for, for, for going through the, the, the expense, the investment, the, the cost, the, the delays, the, the time – the, the time that will be required to develop Anwar. That's just, I mean, people want to focus on what Biden's doing to Anwar, but that's, to me, from an oil standpoint, that's just sort of irrelevant. What is hugely relevant is NPRA. What's hugely relevant is is the federal, the, the other federal lands where we are developing, where we do have projects underway, where we are making investments, where industry is making investment. Uh, to develop uh, to develop uh, new resources, and 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 the Biden proposals have the potential to affect NPRA, but but we need to we need to sort of dive down and understand exactly what's going on. It's important to understand that the Biden prohibitions are on new leases and on new uh, uh, permits. What industry largely has done the leases we've already got. I mean Conoco and others have taken the leases over in NPRA. That, that are currently under development. So it's not the, the prohibition on new leases isn't isn't a big deal, uh, at least in the at least in the near term over the next four, five, ten years isn't isn't a big deal. The the concern may be about new permits because there will be permits. There are permits required to develop those leases. But what industry did, uh, particularly in the lower 48, but also what Conoco did in NPRA, is go in and stockpile permits. 
they had they applied during the Trump administration for a lot of those permits, uh, most of those permits, all of those permits, uh, in some instances that are going to be required for the development of the leases, and have those permits in hand. So the 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 Biden administration is not is not going to have the Biden the Biden changes are not going to have an immediate effect as long as they're dealing with new leases or new permits. Uh, there could be a point you know, over the next five years where we sort of run through all the permits that have been stockpiled, and then it starts becoming a problem. But, but for right now, uh, uh, the, the, focus, the focus we should have uh, in Alaska is on what's going on over in NPRA, and the focus should be on are there any gaps in the permits that we've already got that, uh, that could impair uh, the development of, uh, of, those, uh, of those leases. And Conoco has said in the past that they, like others, had stockpiled a bunch of permits with respect to the Willow development uh, and the developments that they've got going on over at NPRA. So hopefully, hopefully we don't face a crunch uh, uh, quickly. They're a problem. What Biden is proposing to do is a problem, but it's but it's not an immediate crisis. It's a longer term problem that applies uh, from Alaska's standpoint much more to NPRA than it does uh, does any place else. So how do they end run this here? I got about a minute. How do they end run this? Well, you 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 end, you end run it by by what they've done, which is to stockpile permits, and 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 you hope that you've got enough permits to get your to get your uh, the, the development uh, uh, that you currently currently contemplate done. The, the the challenge is if you have if there's any gaps in those permits, I doubt there are. Conoco is pretty good, but if there's any gaps in those permits, or once you get through the current through the current phase of development, wanting to go to the next step, wanting to do additional developments. That you haven't you haven't uh, permitted that that's where the problem will show up. That's about five years down the road. Maybe we have a change in administrations uh, at the at the end of the four years. <laughs> Maybe we can all, fingers crossed, my friend. Fingers crossed. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. Again, as always, uh, good analysis, good stuff. Lots of lots of things to think about here. I appreciate you coming on board, Michael. As always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.